Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee and we are continuing our consideration of H317, an act relating to establishing the Bureau of Racial Justice uh, Statistics and the Bureau of Racial Justice uh, Statistics Advisory Panel. And we are con um, continuing with our testimony and I'd like to welcome Rebecca Turner. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. So for the record, Rebecca Turner from the Office of the Defender General's Appellate Division. Uh, and I understand you do have a number of witnesses still to go and you heard from our chair already. I wanted to um, share five points on this bill. And as uh, the members on the committee may know, I'm also not just a, a, an appellate attorney at the Defender General's Office, but I am the Defender General's designee on the Racial Disparities Advisory Panel. And I've served on that panel since the inception. Um, and and as, uh, as have a number of, of panel members who I think will be speaking today, um, in fact. But it's very exciting that this bill is before this committee. Uh, it's, it really does reflect overall uh, most of the recommendations, I think, uh, possibly just not the comprehensiveness of the, of the data right now, but that was just because it was a, a very enormous report of, of decision-making points. And so thank you for, for getting that drafted and uh, giving it such high priority because it is welcome to see that, that that recognition of the importance of this data collection effort is um, being made now. I think that one of the most important things, and I'm gonna start sequentially with H, 317, but it's one of the most important points and it's already been brought up. And that is the question as to where to put the Bureau. Um, and I think that it, this is one of the most critically important decisions that this body will make. Um, it is fundamentally a structural question. And as others have already represented, Eitan included, I, I join in the group that believes uh, that this, the body should be independent and it should be independent, not just because of what we're asking uh, it to do, um, a massive data collection undertaking and analysis and whether that's done uh, in two separate pieces or not, uh, the independence from politics, the independence from the different stakeholders involved in the criminal and juvenile court systems is really important, as well as the fact that we need of Vermonters to be able to trust the data that goes in and the analysis that comes out. And given the enormous amount of equity that is gonna be invested in this en endeavor, it would be disappointing to say the least to build this and then have it be placed in an entity that's not independent. So then the question becomes, what is an independent body? You saw Tan share the list of eight recommendations that RDAP threw around and um, as he said, we didn't come to a consensus on it. I think the consensus was uh, as reflected in the report that it be independent. I wanted to just clarify some of Eitan's representations of my position on the details, uh, starting with the um, suggestion of uh, placing the Bureau within the executive director of um, racial equities. Uh, the position that Susanna Davis currently holds. And again, I do not support that, although uh, I say that not because I haven't been personally impressed with the work that she's been doing. It's an absolutely incredible job she's been doing. Uh, and again, I've, I'll, I've communicated with this with her too. This isn't a personal issue, it's a structural issue for me. And so I look at the placement of uh, her position within the administration's uh, agency of administration and having it being very closely linked with the governor. And I think that again, the question fundamentally for this body is whether or not that is independent enough. And I think that when we look at the other options available, what, whether it's the creation of a brand new independent body, uh, which is possible, but recognizing that that's a tall order uh, to be made, and speaking with the Defender General and, um, and leaning into his experience, his extensive experience in state government, 
the recommendation that he made and I shared with, with uh, the panel uh, was three, actually, three bodies within the executive. First being on the top of the list was the Secretary of State, um, given that that is, again, independently structured uh, from being elected directly by the, by the uh, public. Uh, and then just structurally set up to be independent. The infrastructure is such as well that we thought that um, entity could be best suited to sort of absorb and build uh, this additional uh, mandate into its, its current system. The second, very close second on the list of recommendations um, was- Actually, excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna interrupt you, but I see that Martin has his hand up. Yeah, yeah thank you, Rebecca. Um, so I've, I've definitely been parts of the, uh, the discussions at RDAP as well, but I guess I, I want to understand a little bit more about the concept of independence. Uh, independent of what? Because none of these entities that are laid out here are necessarily independent. They, they have different constituencies that they might be beholden to. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Secretary of State is elected. Uh, definitely the auditor uh, you know, he, he's elected. And so, I mean, if you could define what are we trying to be independent of, uh, that would be a little, that would be helpful. Thanks. Sure. sure. I, I think that, that that's fair, that, that any given election, politics will, will play a role, right? And, then, and I think that then when you look at the mission and mandate and the structure of the auditor, auditor's um, office and the secretary of state in terms of being charged with voting and, and all of that, that that is where it's built in and has a reputation as well of, of being um, an independent ass ass assessor of sorts, right? And, and turning right to the uh, state auditor's office, for instance. Um, I mean, their, their central mission and in, is independence and to hold state government accountable. Right, so that is a natural um, that, that that is a natural fit, but for the fact that it doesn't have the support to take on something like this, but then I see the language in, at the end of the bill about supplementing with with staff positions. So I think the final the final one that I think this committee should take a serious look at is the recommendation of the. Um, National Center for Restorative Justice. And, and again, that uh, I understand that I, I think Bobby San is, is up for testimony later on. So I'll leave it to him to describe that organization in more detail. But fundamentally, that's the one organization on this list that's named and separate from state government, but worthy of this uh, committee's consideration because it has both the capacity, expertise on both the uh, informational computer data analytics and substantive analytics side. Um, so just not to not consider that. I, I don't want to miss the ADS uh, suggestion, Agency of Digital Services, of course. That was an obvious, seemingly on its surface, an obvious uh, fit um, given their expertise in computers and data collection. Uh, but I think, and as, as Representative Rachelson uh, acknowledged at a a different part of this bill, it's not just that we need data analysts and experts in it, right? We need those who also understand the structures and the organizations, the people who are involved in the criminal and juvenile uh, justice systems. And so that's why I um, have moved away from recommending ADS as that. Certainly they should be part of, um, you know, considering the, the wide, the wide resources available, but not the main primary place to hold uh, this bureau. So that's first. That's the first point. Again, stressing the independence of, of wherever we put the body of this. Um, there are no other questions. I'll move on to point two. Actually, I do see um, Selena. I'm really sorry if I um, if you if you did comment on this and I missed it, but did you comment on the Human Rights Commission as a? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I. I I'm I, curious about that because that one seems particularly promising to me. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. No, it was absolutely one of uh, of, of it was within the top three uh, that the Defender General uh, recommended, and and like you <laughs> indicated there, it's to us the obvious place to to uh, put this as well. Again 
reputation for independence, although uh, not directly elected, right? There are, uh, there's of course a board of commissioners and the subject matter is of course close to their central mandate. So they would be ideal uh, uh, as well. So I think of the list of eight you saw, four of those would be great, three um, within state government, but certainly all four already identified and, and, and exist. I'll, I'll move on. Uh, um, actually, I, um, oh, I'm just gonna see, um, Bob, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning. I heard uh, uh, Representative Lalonde's question and I, I'm still, I don't have a good answer for, from that as of yet, I guess, for, from what you were telling us, the, the importance of the independence versus where it is now as to why it would not work and, and the, the stressing of the independence. If, if, the, if the data is collected and analyzed by agencies that are too closely affiliated with law enforcement, then no matter how accurate or, or or um, however way you could, could claim that it was accurate, there will always be a shroud of that it was biased, that it was independent. The irony is, is that the data collection is trying to unpackage whether there was biases. So I think that that's where I'm getting at in terms of the independence uh, in the nature. The concern is of um, an executive director uh, like Susanna Davis, who serves at the pleasure of the governor. Again, I think that that's where it opens up the door to allowing perhaps politics enter in the fold. Again, I'm not saying this governor, again, structurally speaking, any governor can come in if they are not happy with how the data is, is showing and reflecting on one particular entity or another, that there can be uh, questions as to what is uh, going on in terms of how this is affecting the analysis. But isn't the majority of our, our data presently coming from law enforcement? Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, I, as I understand, traffic stop data uh, yeah. primarily. So we're using that data, but yeah, we're concerned about a bias from law enforcement? We're concerned about how that data is being collected, who is, who is, who is providing that who is uh, analyzing the data, how it's being analyzed. You know, there were issues raised uh, in the earlier discussion about concerns of standardization and uniformity, best practices. Again, it is critically important, whoever is charged with doing all of these things that we trust that they are using the best practices in the field. Um, again, that's where we're the, um, the identification of who is going to do this and who's going to identify those experts becomes critical in terms of again ensuring that it's it's independent okay thank you sure. martin yeah it, it, can i speak a little bit more to the independence just you know giving it some more thought and um so if it is in the executive branch i mean uh, again where the data is going to be collected from it's law enforcement uh, state's attorneys, it's the courts, it's presumably also defender uh, general's office as well. You know, the executive branch is, from what I understand, largely independent of, of most of those entities except for the state police, right? Am I, am I, am I correct about that, first of all, before I go on, uh, Re Rebecca? Is that, I mean, that, that it's, you know, the, the executive branch or the, the governor, I should say, doesn't really, I mean, there's 14 separate states attorneys who really run their own offices. Uh, and, and defenders are obviously independent of that. Courts are a separate branch. So, so a lot of this data, whether if it's in the executive branch, that's not a concern. I agree that it is a concern with respect to the state police, which comes under the, uh, the agency, I mean, the Department of Public Safety. So, um, but that would also suggest if that's what we're talking about, that as far as independence, that we don't want the entity to be analyzing itself because maybe it's gonna be less willing to uh, look at the bad parts and, and make, you know, make things look better than it is. You know, then somebody certainly like the secretary of state, you know, they don't really have, uh, it's, you know, they'll be analyzing 
somebody else, uh, along with these others as well, the National Center for Restorative Justice, et cetera. So I don't know if that helps, Bob, but you know, that's kind of how I'm kind of looking at this. And I don't know if Rebecca, if you wanted to comment on, on that, but I'm just trying to figure this out a little bit better, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, and, and, and you're, you're right, thanks. The independence is not going, speaking to the individual agencies and departments that are providing the data, of course, because each of those are, are operating within um, and doing their own individual missions and mandates. And I would add it, it would include also DCF and Department of Corrections um, and uh, AGOs and diversion programs, all these things where wherever we're, we're trying to collect the Department of Ed potentially some collection agents there. Um, but this this is a huge topic and I, 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 I think it warrants the closer look and, and follow up to, to your questions to make sure you have a, a good understanding of what it means. And um, I threw that out there initially um, and perhaps, um, and I'm happy to come back at another date to dive deeper in to, to that. And, and also particularly to pull in from other states and how they've done it, how they've, how they've ensured um, that independent aspect. Seeing no other questions, uh, point two I wanted to highlight. Again, point two is getting to the specific data that uh, this bill seeks to capture. And for almost the entire most part, that's, that's a great and accurate reflection from the report. There is a piece on there that is a little bit different and I wanted to just sit on that for a little bit. It's on page seven. Let me get to my notes here. Page three, lines 15 and 17. And again, on page five, set line seven and nine. And that's repeated because it's the division between data collection related to the delinquency courts. And then page five, line seven and nine related to the adult criminal side. And this is relating to capturing data on defense attorneys specifically. And that's what's different about this piece of data collection point. This was uh, a request that was made at the late stage of our RDAP panel, a request I think came from the state's attorney's office. Now, um, my comment here is that um, the focus on the data collection point is to include targeting and collecting data of defense counsel based on their legal experience and access to counsel, assignment of counsel as well. As I pointed out at the panel and um, during our discussions on this and here, uh, that A is not something that's collected in Connecticut. It's, it's not collected in Connecticut. And I suspect, and as I pointed out, legal experience of defense counsel isn't a measurement or a standard used in our rules of professional conduct or other standards of measuring um, competency of defense counsel. It's a bit arbitrary, and um, so I don't understand why that is in there. To the extent that there are concerns about capturing data that can assess uh, and capture discretionary decision points and efforts by defense counsel, absolutely, that should be captured and included. I'm not suggesting that defense counsel should be outside of, of the groups. Uh, they're a critical part of the system, as you know. Um, but in terms of singling out defense counsel in that way, it doesn't make sense either from how we currently measure competency and, and, and ethical standards um, and that the other data collection points already being captured, please related to pleas and trials and sentencing, objectively capture those discretionary decision-making points where those come into play. So that's, that's sort of, point to my, my uh, uh, objecting to collecting that to the extent that, that there is an interest in diving deeper into the types of decision-making points of defense counsel, I would urge this uh, committee to also include prosecutors and judges in the mix because to only capture defense counsel on whatever point you decide to pick uh, is an incomplete picture inherently unless you get the prosecutor's equivalent information and the judges as well. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Could you point out, I, I didn't catch where that was that you were- uh, Oh, sure. Uh, and I don't, I, page three, lines 15, 17. 
and page five, line seven and nine. Right, thank you. And, and then point three, I wanted to talk about, it's the bottom of page six, top of page seven. And this is where the bill discusses the Bureau's rule, critical section of the bill as well. Um, and for the most part, what language is there on in that section is great. My points here are um, critical information lacking right now. And this was touched upon earlier. Um, there is a, a lack of an enforcement mechanism built into this bill. So what happens when the individual entities don't provide the data, don't provide it either in a timely fashion or at all, or an incomplete amount? What happens? How much is this a recommendation versus a requirement that has to be done and given to the Bureau? And, and what happens if, if it doesn't, doesn't happen? Uh, and then the other part of that is there, there's lack of, of language as to um, the regularity and frequency that the data sharing occur. What we have is how much, how often the Bureau is to report to the panel, and that's monthly. And then, um, and then the Bureau will report annually to the bodies uh, in the legislature, but not to, as to, again, the critical part, which is the frequency and regularity as to when the individual agencies, uh, courts uh, have to provide the data to the Bureau for analysis. So that's point three, two critical pieces that I just wanna make sure uh, you're aware because without enforcement, without knowing how often this happens, again, there, there's, a, there's a place where things can fall through in terms of effectiveness of this bill. Point four is the composition. Um, excuse me, I'm, oops, I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but um, I, I do see two hands. Um, I see uh, Selena and Coach, and I'm sorry if I'm getting you out of order. Yeah, Coach could go first. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks, Selena. Um, a quick question, and it's in reference to your uh, accountability uh, uh, aspect. Um, and we have given authority through independent entities for subpoena power. So it would seem to me that would be the ultimate tool, you know, if there was a question as to, let's say the Bureau uh, is assigned the task of gathering the data, the advisory panel could be offered the authority to grant subpoena in order to ensure if the body came back to them and said, hey, we can't get the information. We've been asking and asking. And you, you see what I'm getting at? You know, I, I know it's kind of deep in the weeds at this point, but at the same time, I think that that type of uh, thinking could uh, resolve the, uh, the situation. And then sometimes just having those things in place is enough to say, uh, we're not even going to go there because I don't want to get called out. <laughs> but anyways, food for thought. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. And Selena. Um, yes. What was my question? <laughs> oh, I know. It was about the enforcement piece. Um, uh, so I, I'm just wondering if you have any specific recommendations about that as we move forward. And I, I know that, um, you know, in some of the use of force reform that we did, um, the underlying, one of the underlying bills last year actually tied um, the data collection, the um, traffic stop data collection to state funding in some ways. And I'm wondering, so that comes to mind to me as one mechanism, but I'm wondering if you have others in mind just before we move on from this. Uh, thanks for the question. And, and, and in addition to uh, Representative Christie's suggestion, Subpoena, your, your pointing, and, and that was where I was, I was trying to remember the exact bill and the legislation, but it is exactly that where it made me think tie it to funding, 
right? And 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 make it be those two consequences are or ramp, you know, that those are real, those are tangible, that's enforcement. Um, so yes, I don't have any other ideas at this time, but those two are great suggestions. Thank you and thanks, thanks, coach, for your idea too. So the the fourth point, almost to my fifth, a fourth point is is going to the composition of the panel. Now, uh, I appreciate the language in the current bill, making sure that there's uh, representation from BIPOC communities. Um, what I didn't see was assurance that there would be any experts in the criminal and juvenile uh, court systems uh, that there would be any expertise in those areas that they that they would be included or required to be captured in, in the panel. So I just wanted to point that out that in, that the way it's currently written, we could have a panel uh, entirely made up of people who aren't who are not familiar with the criminal juvenile justice systems. So I think I don't think that that was the intent, but certainly I want to highlight that that omission and it and it should be there should be experts who have uh, experience direct experience um, in, in both of those court systems. The other part of that panel so that goes to pages seven and eight. The other part of that panel that uh, concern in terms of the composition of the panel is not just that there be experts, but that there be fair and balanced representation on that panel of the children and adults who are in this criminal juvenile justice system. Uh, critically, we need their voices to be heard and represented and not just one voice on the panel, but again, fair and balanced representation on that panel. So just in consideration in terms of uh, what would be ideal uh, composition of that panel. And finally, uh, going to the details on the Bureau's positions it was um, described as a position titled information technology data analyst. And again, this, this was a concern raised earlier by Representative Rachelson and I joined in that concern that it's a title that appears both too narrow and, and perhaps too broad. Uh, the point being that we need to make sure that it's not just an informational data analyst, generally speaking, but some one who also has um, an understanding of the structures and people involved specifically in the criminal juvenile justice system. And that is, that, those, that's the end of my, my list. Great, well, thank you. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. And as, as you can see, definitely um, had a good, good response and engagement from the committee. So, so thank you. Uh, Anything else for Rebecca? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And this really is the, the beginning of the conversation. So certainly we'll have you back. And um, so looking at our, our time and our need for a hard stop, I am going to go to um, Bobby Sand. I'm sorry, the other witnesses, if we don't get to you. Uh, but again, we, we certainly will have more time and so, with uh, with that is uh, let's see if Professor Sand is there. You are Good Professor morning. Sand is here. Yes. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, having weird uh, earbud situations. So I hope you can hear me. We can. Uh, for the record, Robert Sand. I am the former Windsor County State's Attorney. Uh, professor at Vermont Law School now, founding director of the Center for Justice Reform, which has blossomed really nicely to now be a uh, co-institute as part of the National Center on Restorative Justice, uh, a partnership between VLS, the University of Vermont, and the University of San Diego. Uh, more about that in just a few moments. I'm also the uh, high bailiff for Windsor County, Vermont. Uh, the views that I'm expressing are, are mine and mine alone. I, I wanna just start, and I'm gonna kind of motor through because I know time is short, to echo Senator Sears' opening remarks when you were in joint session, which is without accurate data, we rely excessively on stories and anecdotes and stories are important, 
but stories alone shouldn't drive policy. Stories are important, particularly from the people adversely impacted by the justice system, but those stories become even stronger when they are supported by data. So this is an incredible opportunity to drill down to really look at what is driving the racial disparities within our system. Without in any way diminishing the importance of understanding the causes of our racial disparities, we also know in this country and in this state that we have economic injustice and geographic injustice. Brian Stevenson says, we treat rich people who are guilty more favorably than we treat poor people who are innocent. This bill creates a vehicle to look at bias across the board. And I know it's huge already, and perhaps I'm suggesting it become even bigger, but it does provide that vehicle to look not just at racial injustice, but economic injustice. And we also know when you cross a county line in Vermont, you get a different outcome. So it provides the opportunity to look at geographic justice. One of the things that happens in Vermont because our numbers are small is that uh, disparities can, uh, individual disparities or a small collection of disparities can drive the whole numbers. And so it becomes important here to be able to really drill down to figure out is what we're looking at a systemic problem or is it geographical, is it regional, is it departmental, is it individual? And we ought not to devise, and I think I'm echoing Senator Sears here a little bit, a systemic response if in fact the issue is really regional or local or perhaps individual. Folks are not going to be ecstatic about having a microscope or a magnifying glass held up to their work. And the reality is everyone who we're talking about here, I believe are uh, public actors, and that is just a byproduct of, of public service. And we need to be able to look with precision at individual actors, cognizant of some of the privacy concerns that were raised earlier. Some people are going to embrace sharing data, others maybe not so much. The language in this initial amazing draft talks about collaboration that may not be strong enough to get the information that you are seeking. You may in fact need uh, a mandate. For discussion at a later date, it's not entirely clear to me that all the entities from whom you're seeking to acquire data have the ability to collect that and transmit it. And so that's a logistical concern. Uh, let me try to stay kind of high level. I want to raise a point that is in this bill and is something more broadly I hope we'll all think about, and that is language. This bill, and I don't mean this in any way the criticism of the drafter, but this bill refers to offenders, and these happen to be juveniles who have just been brought into the system and haven't been adjudicated. We need to really be careful about language. And when we talk about offenders or inmates or prisoners, we dehumanize the people we are talking about. And we can talk about prisoners and inmates and not have to think so much about that what we're really talking about is human beings who we are locking in boxes. And so just language becomes really, really important. The advisory board. I think it's excellent that there is uh, language to talk about diversity, but there isn't 
someone who's ensuring that each of the appointed people collectively represents uh, a diverse body. So as you work through those details, uh, making sure that there is someone who's saying, oh, person A got appointed by this entity. Let's make sure that when entity B, C, and D make appointments, we achieve the kind of diversity that we are hoping for. Uh, I promise not to get down too much into the weeds, but I also want to flag one other issue. It's not entirely clear to me who hires the this new executive director. And I sent uh, Eric an email about that. I think that's not clear. Placement of the Bureau is critically important and independence is critically important. And because the issue isn't complicated enough, let me throw out yet another proposal, which is some sort of hybrid model. And that is that it would be potentially housed within the executive branch, but an independent entity like the National Center on Restorative Justice has some role to help ensure that there is complete independence of voice. And so let me just say a word about the National Center. Uh, it is a partnership funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance between VLS, UVM, and the University of San Diego. UVM coordinates the research and data components of the National Center. And uh, I am authorized to say that they certainly have an interest in some involvement. Uh, I'm not convinced placing this entire new entity under the auspices of a federally funded organization makes the most sense, but having an independent voice, I think uh, certainly would, uh, would make some sense. Final comment. This is a bill about justice. Uh, two final comments. Uh, I share uh, Rebecca Turner's uh, concern, I guess, about only looking at public defenders. I do think because individual actors can influence our overall numbers in a small state, that understanding if there are patterns that emanate from individual actors, be they public defenders, prosecutors, judges, police officers, DCS, DCF offices, that's valuable to know. But singling out public defenders as compared to prosecutors does not, to me, make sense. And honestly, if either entity were to be singled out, it probably would make more sense to do that for prosecutors who tend to drive outcomes arguably more than any other actor within the justice system. So my final comment in a bill about justice and perhaps trying to echo back to Brian Stevenson's uh, paraphrase, we still deny people charged with crimes in Vermont access to public defenders. And I know this committee passed a bill during the last biennium. I know there's a bill pending H-238 that would say every person charged with a crime is entitled, who is indigent is entitled to services of a public defender. Poverty punishes enough. And there is no such thing as a non-serious crime. I sent uh, the two chairs this morning and Evan O'Connor, a Washington Post commentary from yesterday about how misdemeanor charges, charging people with low-end offenses is making us less safe. And so a bill that looks at diversion and alternatives should also look at making sure that every person who comes into court when they are indigent, is entitled to an attorney, regardless of the outcome, because misdemeanor convictions change people's lives forever. 
and it shouldn't happen casually. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to answer questions if I can. Great, thank, thank you so much, Bobby. And again, I'm sorry that, um, that I am rushing you, but as I said, this is the beginning of a, of a conversation. So, uh, Selena, did you have your hand up or no? Um, anybody, I'm not, I'm not seeing hands. Um, I also invite any of our um, witnesses and panel um, I think Martin has a seen that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Um, okay, Martin. And then if there's time after Martin, if any of our um, other witnesses wanted to ask a question, uh, please go ahead. Okay, Martin. Yeah, I, I just re really want to explore, I don't know if you have additional thoughts on this right now, uh, Bobby, but uh, the hybrid model and how that would really look. I mean, I know that was high level that you gave that to us. That, that seems to be... <clears throat> Figuring out where this should be seems to be the biggest obstacle to trying to get this thing done uh, this session as uh, Senator Sears suggests that we should do. Uh, so if, if you have more you can say on that now or, or if you can think about that more and actually look at language and see who else we can talk to and how that works, uh, I think that's really important. And, and maybe, you know, in fact, in just the three minutes or so that we have Maybe now is not the time, but I really would like to explore that or have us explore that with you uh, further to really understand how that would work. Uh, happy to ponder that, send you an email and suggest some other names as well. All right, thanks. Uh, Selena. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it relates to Martin's question, so maybe it is. So maybe if we do get to have a deeper, further conversation with you, it could the exploration maybe belongs there. But I'm just wondering. You had talked about the hybrid um, model um, still being located in the executive branch, and I wonder if you wanted to comment on, um, you know, with, could that work equally well in some of the other places that have been named such as the Human Rights Commission or? Uh, I thought uh, Rebecca Turner had some excellent suggestions for possible other locations. I, I think in a perfect world, it would be a standalone entity, mm -hmm. but we don't live in a perfect world and we should not underestimate the challenges of acquiring the data. That's going to involve new systems for new organizations. That's going to involve uh, potentially different data collection mechanisms, maybe even programs in certain different departments, even though we're beginning to move toward more standardization. But even if law enforcement were to standardize, prosecutors use one system, the judiciary uses another system, the defenders use another system. DCF uses another system. It, it is daunting to figure out how to amalgamate data collected in different ways from different organizations into information that is usable and reportable. Uh, my worry if this bureau is wholly independent of the executive branch, is, or at least I should say of state government, is it will bump up against resistance, potentially even intransigence, if I've said that word properly, in providing the data. And so it really does need teeth of some sort to be able to, to collect the data. And yes, uh, coaches, uh, Representative Christie's su suggestion of su uh, subpoenaing may work, but I just have this sense that for it to really function and have the, the leverage and authority it needs, finding a location within state government, whether that is the Secretary of State's office, the Human Rights Commission, uh, the auditor, uh, I, I guess I'd like to think about that further. I should just put in one other little plug, and I apologize if this sounds a bit self-serving. Um, 
The high bailiff right now essentially does nothing. The high bailiff is a position that was designed to be an independent actor within the criminal justice system. There may well be a role here as a conduit between county actors and the entity that's trying to acquire the, the data. I don't know what that is exactly, but since we're still at a high level, I, I throw that out now. And, and uh, there definitely, it, it's really important that you talk to some people and you may have, and I apologize for, for coming in late to this, who understand data collection because that is largely going to inform, I believe, some of the language of this bill. It's, it's complicated. I, and I am by no means an expert, but there are folks out there who know the best way to routinize the collection of data so that it is usable in a reportable form. And I'll pass on to uh, Evan and, and your chair, perhaps some names. Great. Well, thank you, Bobby. Thank you, as, thank you. as always, for your you. helpful and interesting testimony. And um, and my apologies to David Chair and Judge Grierson for not getting to you, but we will we will return to this soon. So thank you. And with that, we're going to turn to H-225, uh, which is a bill that um, House Human Services uh, passed out, I believe, in a 11-0 vote, but we will we'll, we'll hear from Chair Pew. Um, but we also have Michelle Childs here to do, um, hi Michelle, to do a walkthrough of the bill. Um, and uh, Michelle, perhaps you could share with um, with us because of our new members and those watching on YouTube, the, the, um, the history of this bill and, and specifically uh, this committee's um, history of the bill. And I also, uh, welcome Selena to um, to jump in as, as well. So good morning, thank you. Sure, good morning everyone. Um, so this bill started in 2019 and it was originally in uh, House Judiciary. Uh, and what it does is there's, as you know about the, um, the way that I think you guys have worked with the drug statutes recently, but maybe not this year for new folks. But the way that the drug statutes are organized is that um, in Title 18 and Chapter 84, what you have is uh, the they'll have each type of drug. So whether it's cannabis, cocaine, um, heroin, and it'll be divided up into the different statutes and it'll have penalties for possession, dispensing and sale. And those penalties increase depending on the amount that is involved. And so there is a general catch-all statute that pertains to depressants, stimulants, and narcotics. And so that is, it's like this, um, so unlike where you have like cocaine, where there's a specifically uh, identifiable drug, this one's like a catch-all. So this is where things that would fall in, like if you have oxy pills that are not yours, they wouldn't prescribe to you and you've got a lot of those. Or, or if there's different substances that fall into those categories that, that are fall outside those other statutes. And so, um, and what they use for determining that, because it's not straight across the board and we're talking about uh, dozens, if not, I don't know, hundreds of drugs, is they use a benchmark standard. And, uh, and so what they say is the way that the amounts increase through this particular statute is they say a person in possession of any stimulant, narcotic, or depressant, you know, an unlawful possession of those, so meaning without a prescription, um, is a one-year misdemeanor because our, our lowest level possession for any amount of a regulated drug um, is for uh, is for a one-year misdemeanor. And then it starts to increase depending on how much you possess. And so the next level is 100 times a benchmark. And a benchmark is determined by rule through the Department of Health. And so if you go on and you look at the Department of Health's rules, they have this long list of all kinds of different drugs and chemical compounds and things like that. And they will establish the amount for each particular drug that is a benchmark. 
And then that's how they determine the amounts through the statute. So House Judiciary passed the predecessor for H-225 in 2019. And, um, and, for, and what they did is they made a carve out to the one year misdemeanor penalty for unlawful possession of a depressant stimulant or narcotic. They made a carve out for uh, possess, unlawful possession of buprenorphine. And I won't go a lot into that because I'm sure that Representative Colburn and Representative Pugh can talk to you more about, about why they're doing this and um, the, the reasons behind. But essentially, buprenorphine is, is a drug that is used um, uh, for people who uh, have uh, opiate addiction. And it can um, uh, help people uh, calm the side, the side effects of withdrawal from, from an opiate. And, um, and it is often something that is traded and used illegally um, by people who uh, su suffer from opiate uh, misuse disorder. And so it is, people can get a prescription for it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, this committee, I think, has dealt enough with over the years issues around substance misuse where, you know, people are ready for treatment when they're ready for treatment. And sometimes, and so, uh, so this was done, the decriminalization of these small amounts of, of buprenorphine was done as a, a harm reduction measure. So saying if someone is caught with a, with a, with a smaller amount, then it wouldn't, there would not be a criminal penalty. And so when judiciary first passed in 2019, you just left the existing structure for, for it and you did the carve out for the for the one year misdemeanor and then it would just if the next level was what you have in statute now where it increases if you have 100 times the benchmark once judiciary passed it out of committee it then went to house human services and house human services started working on it and so they had um, some concerns about that the 100 times a benchmark was too much and they wanted to narrow it down for the exception. And so they worked on that issue. Um, they also looked at the, would you treat under 21s who, uh, who are in possession of that smaller amount? And so, um, and so those are the issues that they've been grappling with for the last two years. And so the bill did not move out of human services in 2019, but they did hold a number of hearings in 2020 and they passed it out of human services, I believe the day before we shut down um, last year. And so it did not move forward on that. And then this year, Representative Pugh introduced the bill and then they've been working on it and then they voted it out. And so now that Representative Pugh is here, I don't know if you wanna, now that I've kind of given you the history of it and do you wanna, talk to them before I do a walkthrough or do you want me to do the walkthrough now or? Um, I am at the chair's um, pleasure. I don't know if you did let folks know that not only did it pass unanimously out of our committee last year as amended um, with uh, Representative Brunstead making the motion and Representative Rosenquist seconding the motion, uh, the bill passed um, unanimously um, with support from our committee. All right, thank you. Thank you so much and welcome. Good to, good to see you. And yes, it was actually on March 13th. I remember Representative Haas was gonna come down, was scheduled to come down to our committee to report the, uh, report the bill. And then we were told to wrap up and and leave. They left it. Yeah. So, um, so well, I, yeah, I really, really appreciate your committee um, taking it up and passing it. And glad to. Well, have you're, um, Madam Chair, your 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 committee started this work, um, uh, and um, so we have um, your committee's thanks for starting the work. And um, if there's a way that I can. Um, mention the um, former representative from Rochester on the House floor. I will try to do it because um, she uh, made me promise that I would um, introduce it this year. Great. Sounds great. Well, well, thank you so much. Uh, okay, well, why don't we have um, Michelle do the walkthrough and the uh, 
bill should be posted or you can find it again. It's, um, is it 2.1, is that the correct draft, Michelle? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Evan, can you let me share my screen? And then um, committee members and Representative Pugh, I'm considering you a committee member <laughs> for this. Um, when we uh, share screens, I often don't see folks uh, hands. So just jump in if I haven't, if I haven't recognized you, if you, if you have uh, questions for Michelle. Thank you. Great, thank you, Evan. Okay, so everybody can see the, the amendment? Great. Yes. Okay, so, um, so because of the structure of the drug laws, um, sometimes when uh, something is not, is not criminalized, but doing it through an omission. Um, sometimes it's a little hard for people to kind of read through, but I, it, you, you wanna work with the existing structure of what we have for the criminal statutes for drugs. And so I, I added an intent section just so we could have upfront a plain language explanation of what this bill does. Cause I think sometimes if you just look at the technical language, it's a little harder for, especially folks who don't work with the criminal statutes very often. Um, so you just see the intent section just uh, saying that the General Assembly intends to decriminalize possession of 224 milligrams or less of buprenorphine. And that is the amount that the Human Services Committee determined that they were comfortable with from a policy perspective in terms of a person possessing um, that person. It should be OK for a person to possess for their personal amount without being um, guilty of a crime. Um, Starting on line nine, persons under 21 years of age who are in possession of that smaller amount would be referred to the court diversion program for purpose of enrollment in the Youth Substance Awareness Safety Program. That is uh, how you currently treat the uh, 16 to 20 year olds who are in possession of an ounce or less of cannabis or who are in possession of alcohol and, and um, so both of those uh, being legal substances, but not legal for under 21s to possess. So this is just mirroring the existing process for cannabis and alcohol. And then similarly, on starting on line 12, and persons under 16 year, years of age in possession of that smaller amount would be subject to delinquency proceedings in the family division. Again, that is that mirrors what you have for cannabis and alcohol. For those of you on the committee who have been there for a while, you might recall that when the legislature decriminalized cannabis in 2013, I think that's when you took away, it used to be a delinquency, um, or where you didn't do the delinquency for the under 16s, because I think the testimony at the time from the Defender General's office was that that wasn't the best way to go. And so you were having the under 16s get referred to diversion as well. But the AG's office came to the legislature last year and asked for a change to go back to the to what they have for alcohol for the under 16s and do that for cannabis because they wanted to make sure that the under 15s who were in possession had access to DCF services. And so you passed that last year. So right now uh, you have the under 16s going through family division and you have the 16 to 20 year olds um, are being referred to diversion program. Um, and, uh, and so this is just modeling existing law. Um, if you possess more than that 224 milligrams, that would fall under the existing penalty structure. Um, so there's no change to that. So moving on to the language of C section two at the bottom of page one, and then you see the language at the top of page two. So just creating an exception in subdivision 1A for what the language that you have starting on line five is that a person knowingly and unlawfully possessing 224 milligrams or less shall not be punished in accordance with the, with the above provision. So that's just the carve out. So if you have more, let's say you have 400 milligrams, that's gonna go under and you're gonna be punished under 1A. But if you're within that limit, that other limit, then there is no penalty. And if you have 100 times the benchmark, then you're going under the next provision that's in existing law and, and uh, uh, as well. So subsection C is dealing with the possession by youth under 21. 
And it's just what I had said before. Um, so just as a little refresher um, for folks who've been on the committee for a while and something new for new folks is that the way that the referral works for the under 21s is, so let's say um, you have like an 18 year old that is um, caught with a joint now, um, is they would receive a civil ticket from a law enforcement officer and that and there, it would be a referral to the court diversion program in the county in which the person is cited. And um, it would be their responsibility to contact the diversion board within two weeks. And then the diversion board would work with them and come up with a contract with them to, um, and they would go through the, the youth substance awareness safety program. Um, and any other conditions that they that are part of their diversion contract with the board. And if they successfully complete the terms of their diversion contract, then there's no penalty. However, if they fail to if they fail to contact the diversion board or they don't complete the terms of their contract and they essentially flunk out of the diversion program, then there would be the imposition of a $300 civil penalty. Um, plus a 30 day license suspension. Uh, and if it's a second or a subsequent offense and they, uh, they failed that as well, then it would be a $600 civil penalty and a 90 day suspension. And those, and again, that's, that's under current law for cannabis and alcohol. And this is just mirroring that through incorporation by reference. And so, and then the under 16 is going through family division. And then the law takes effect this July. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not seeing any hands, but I don't want to miss anybody. And especially for uh, new members to the committee, if you, or returning um, members. Please, uh, please raise your hand if you need Michelle to clarify anything or review anything, because we really haven't done that. We haven't really done much uh, drug policy this, this year, so, but, okay. Well, not seeing anybody. So um, Representative Pugh, I'll turn to you now um, to give us an idea of testimony um, that, you, that you took and, and your committee's uh, thinking in, in coming to, to this unanimous vote. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, when the bill first came to our committee last year, it was um, uh, because of the health issues, um, because of its, uh, that um, we in this state and best practice um, considers um, substance use disorder and, um, and, uh, and opiate um, use disorder, a public health issue. And the way to address it is through public health. And um, this bill is part of the continuum of strategies um, that fall under what I would call, what we call um, harm reduction, to save lives and to move um, those Vermonters who are struggling um, with opiate addiction, to move them into treatment and into productive um, lives. This is just one tool um, and, uh, it, for um, addressing the opiate epidemic, which during the time of uh, COVID, we have seen a 38% um, increase in opiate um, deaths. And so anything we can do now, um, I think is important. But over the years, we've, um, Vermont has, uh, adopted many tools such as um, the syringe exchange or hub and spokes, widespread um, distribution of Narcan or naloxin, which is um, the overdose prevention, um, an increase in the number of um, physicians willing to be providers um, in the hub and spoke. Um, and uh, our emergency rooms are, um, um, have the rapid, in, um, rapid induction of uh, MAT um, if someone presents themselves um, to the emergency room. Over the past um, two years, we heard from um, doctors, we heard from um, people who are um, 
recovering from substance use and from opiate um, uh, disorder. We heard from um, family members. We heard from uh, law enforcement and um, uh, a wide range of of um, practice so a wide range of practitioners um, in the field, and we uh, this year um, made a point of again hearing from um, two medical providers and from the uh, attorney general. Uh, that what he is the attorney general uh, and from uh, um, oh what is she? and. Huh? I'm going to forget her name. I apologize. Um, the person who's who did we hear from, Michelle? Willa Willa Farrell. Thank she you, Willa Farrell. Diversion program at the AG's office. Sorry, um, and the diversion program. I apologize. Um, but I mean, anyway, all of these um, fall under harm reduction, and um, that's what we focused on. We focused on um, that aspect, and we didn't want to. Um, it's not. We respected the work that and thought that the work that you all have done as it relates to alcohol and um, um, cannabis um, as it relates to youth um, was that we were going to follow in your footsteps in terms of that, um, that that made sense um, in the sense of the added risk and the added importance it is um, to uh, provide a path towards treatment. Because not only do we want to um, save lives, but we want um, this is a path towards treatment. Um, there's this is more your um, bailiwick than um, ours, um, but sale is still a crime, and the um, the amount that we uh, chose, 224 um, milligrams, is what we heard in terms of testimony from um, from doctors and from prescribers prescribers is that's a one to two week supply. Um, so it is, um, but so sale is still a crime. And, um, um, you know, and you know the stuff about if it's more than 224, it's going to still be a misdemeanor. And if it's greater than 3,600, it's a felony. Um, so this doesn't, um, you know, change anything except people who have on their person a small amount of buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is a, a medicine, um, if you want, that is used in the treatment of um, opiate substance use disorder um, because it reduces uh, the relapse of people in recovery by blocking cravings and um, it reduces the likelihood of a fatal overdose. And we heard that um, repeated testimony. Uh, last year that um, um, those individuals who are using um, non-prescribed um, buprenorphine, um, actually they later seek treatment. But right now they're either um, hesitant um, to go to formal treatment or they um, going to formal treatment um, is incompatible with their job. I mean, we heard people, I mean, the people who we heard testimony from were Vermonters who are working, who are, um, who are supporting their families, supporting themselves. And um, uh, the cost of the, um, and they didn't want to have on their health insurance if they had health insurance, that they were getting this, they were, that they were getting this drug. Um, so, um, what I said yesterday in committee is, um, I was thinking of children. Um, this is like Goldilocks and the three bears. Some of you may think that the bowl is too big and some may think that it doesn't go far enough. But our committee thought this path um, strikes a good middle ground and it's just right. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. and and. Um, again, this amount is dramatically less than what we had uh, last year when it when it came to you, and I think that's an important important point. Um, committee members, any any questions or Selena, do you want to add anything? Um, 
Um, I, I do see um, your vice chair has his hand up. OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. How are you doing, Madam Chair? <laughs> I'm good. I haven't forgiven you from leaving yet. Okay. <laughs> For those of you who don't know who used to be on human services before yeah, he became my, vice chair. My first, my first four years, I was uh, lucky enough to be on human services with, with Chair Pugh and, uh, and, and learned an awful lot from her. But um, and, uh, uh, Chair Grad just answered one of my questions because I was going to ask, what's the difference between this bill and, and what we looked at before, I, I wasn't here for the walkthrough, so it, some of this may have been said. Um, I came in right right at the end of the walkthrough, but uh, so um, so it's 224 milligrams or less. Do you, do you remember what the amount was um, in the bill before? No, because we didn't like it, but I think um, it was too no. much. Yeah, not, not that it matters. It's more curiosity thing. And uh, actually, hold on, Michelle, do you remember? Yes. The, so the way that it worked is, so Tom, the as you know, because you've worked on this committee for a while on the drug laws, is that you have the lowest level possession limit for all the different crimes. It'll just say a person who possesses whatever drug unlawfully, and then it'll be a one-year misdemeanor. And then the next subdivision will create a threshold for going up in penalties. <laughs> And the way that it's done for this particular statute, because it's a catch-all covering all otherwise unnamed like stimulants, depressants, and narcotics, it uses benchmarks. And also the next level up is a hundred times the benchmark. And so that's where the penalty distinction between the lowest level and then the felony level. And the benchmarks are something that's established by the Department of Health by rule. The way the judiciary had done it is rather than carve out an amount between the lowest level, which is anything, and the next level, which is 100 times the benchmark, you guys just carved it out of that level and said anything that is a misdemeanor, one-year misdemeanor level, means that it's like anything that's below 100 times the benchmark. So human services, when they started taking testimony from practitioners on how much is prescribed, things like that, felt as though that was much too big of an amount to be possessed to get de to decrease. And so you just used the existing structure and didn't create a new amount level. And what they did is they said, we're going to exempt it from the misdemeanor, but we're not going to but there's still going to be some possession of you that will continue to be a misdemeanor. And that's when it's, when it's um, above 224 milligrams up to a hundred times the benchmark. And, and what's, what's the benchmark? I think I haven't looked at the department of health rules lately, but my recollection was it was 36 milligrams was, a, was the benchmark for the department of health. And so um, you would do a hundred times, that and so you'd you'd be at three thousand six hundred. Yep, yep. So so, so right now, uh, uh, say one milligram up to the three thousand six hundred or whatever is a misdemeanor. Correct. Okay, okay, okay. I see. I see where we're going with this now. And then right. And, so and, what and Human Services did, they figured out what would be. Um, so it's essentially, I think, you know, you divide 224 by 36, you come up with six or six something. And so okay. um, just going to do that. <laughs> so rather, so it would be like rather than 100 times the benchmark, it's like six or seven times the benchmark. Yeah, 6.2. Okay. Um, so uh, Chair Pugh, I, I when when we were when I was on on your committee, we we did something around. Uh, I don't remember if it was decrim, but I do remember it was something around uh, um, a a medication for opiate addiction. And the issue back then was people. Uh, I think we decided to individually wrap. Uh, the, the medication and some of it had a, a coating on it. So it made it harder to break it down, um, it, you know, and to be able to inject it or smoke it. I don't remember which, but, and I know I'm 
I don't remember, and I know it's getting to be a few years ago now, but do you remember what that medication was? Because that, that medication was an addictive medication. And where I'm going with that is I don't know a lot about uh, buprenorphine. And is buprenorphine potentially addictive or no? Um, uh, uh, Tom, um, buprenorphine, if you um, have an opioid use disorder, buprenorphine will not get you high. Okay. That is, that is why, um, so if you have a, if you have a, um, a substance use disorder, um, it will not get you high. Um, if you've never tried it, it might. Okay, you gotcha. Little, you know. Um, gotcha. So it's what, um, I'm gonna assume that it's not a blocker like the Narcan is. Um, um, it or blocks it cravings. It, it, um, no, I mean, Narcan, Narcan is, you know, when you have overdosed. Right. Um, this is, you haven't overdosed on this. This is, okay. this, this will block or curb your cravings. Okay. And again, I apologize because so, I, so, um, um, this may have we, been said earlier. No, that's okay. I mean, so without being, um, doing, doing a broad brush, it is more similar to anti abuse, okay, or alcohol. I mean, it's going to curb your um, your cravings. Sure, and, and I guess from there, I would ask if if you'd never done it before uh, and you can get high on it, does does it work like an opiate? I guess, or no? I, I again, this is uh, um, sure. I'm getting education here, so well, that's that's. Um... It, um, there is some risk if you are, I mean, you know, and that is, that's is why this is a harm reduction. There is, you know, if sure. you are opioid naive, which means you have never ever um, uh, used it, but you're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to be looking for it. That won't get you high the way, um, the way, uh, you know, heroin or any other opioid is going to get you high. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So you're not going to have the, the the mental or or physical cravings for it if if you do happen to use it to get high. I'm assuming that's that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I may have some more questions later, but uh, absolutely. Yeah. Good to uh, see you. Well, good to see you. And I, you know, I do, I, I do want to, um, I do want to be honest. This is not a panacea. This is no. a step. This is a harm reduction. Right. This is getting people to, this is saving lives and taking a path towards treatment. Yeah. And as in fact, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, um, the argument against this would be everyone has access to treatment. We know that they don't. Right. And we know that some people are treatment hesitant. Um, yeah. And we know that some people can't access. And so um, it, is, um, it, is the, it, it is a public health response to treat this as a public health issue and um, to ensure that people move towards treatment. Sure, the, and there's some similarities with, with this in, uh, in Narcan uh, in that it, uh, Narcan is not a panacea, it's not a cure-all. Uh, but it is a step toward, uh, um, you know, public safety, health, uh, you know, life saving. Um, so I can see some similarities there. And, and, uh, and we actually did all the Narcan work or most of it back when I was on the committee. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and, and the, the testimony that we heard um, um, in particular last year from, um, from, from law enforcement, from people who are from, um, from, from social workers, practitioners, and um, doctors who are working in the field, um, people are not um, you, uh, people are not using buprenorphine to get high. Right. I guess, and that kind of reminds me. In, uh, another question, maybe is uh, 
so what how often does this occur now i guess is and, and you may not know as as far as people uh being arrested for having uh the buprenorphine without a prescription and that type of thing i mean is it uh is, is it real common because i gotta believe if somebody's got it that uh they probably aren't going to want to give it up um in most instant instances um the testimony that we um, heard and the testimony that we heard um, this this year um, confirmed it as well. While um, while prosecution um, of buprenorphine, um, while, while possession of buprenorphine is rarely um, rarely pr um, prosecuted. For instance, at, um, the um, attorney general in Addison County and in Chittenden County and I think somewhere else have actually sort of publicly said they're not going to do that. Um, this, leg this legislation um, will support equity across the state so that people are not treated differently. Um, it will support and encourage um, Vermonters to seek alternat alternatives um, to manage their substance use disorders, and it will ensure that no matter where you live, um, you'll be equity treated the same. Right. And, and is this, uh, I mean, a lot of things that, that we've done, you know, as far as changing, uh, uh, you know, penalties and that type of thing, is this, is this going to lean more toward what's ha happening in real life in, in court, courtrooms? Um, if people, if they aren't, uh, if the convictions aren't coming? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your um, question. Maxine, do you know where I'm going with that? <laughs> I can't think of another way to word it. Not sure, but Michelle, um, it's Michelle does. what's happening on the ground, I guess. Michelle, I think I, I think if, I, if, I, think I can answer right. that one, which is um, is that has been the testimony, but it's inconsistent. So you have some state's attorneys who have been very open about that they are not going to be charging for these things, but it's not, as you know, that you deal with this all the time in this committee is you can at times have 14 different kinds of justice and somebody, you know, with the same offense could be treated very differently depending on where they live in the state. And so I think what Representative Pugh was talking about is it creates more uniformity. So you may, so you don't wind up with, well, if you're caught with it in Addison or Chittenden, you're referred to services, but if you're caught with it in Rutland, you're going to be charged with a crime. And so it's it's taking it and you making the policy decision at the state level and saying this is how we want as a state to treat people who have smaller amounts of this. So it should create more consistency and reflect what's being done in the in the counties now that have chosen not to prosecute. Right, and, and then still, I mean, 100 times the benchmark is still only a civil penalty, right? Now? No, it's a crime. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, there's no civil penalties in this at all. So if you have over this kind of therapeutic dosage, if you have over that amount, it would still be a crime. But then the state's attorney would have the option to use all the off ramps that you've created over the last several years as well. Sure. So they could they could refer the person to diversion. They could do a deferred sentence. They could. There's a lot of options they could do, and it, yeah. it just varies county by county and how they and how the state's attorney treats these types of cases. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, uh, that's it for now. I promise. <laughs> Okay, no, thank you for your questions. Um, okay, I see Ken and then. Barbara, and it's um, 10 of 12, and um, we have been asked to do a straw poll on this, so that's where we're where we're heading. Uh, Ken. If this, uh, good morning, if this drug was, wasn't addictive to other people, um, we wouldn't even be dealing with this as a bill right now, would we? I mean, what I remember when I first came on this committee, that's the problem, is that it, it can be addictive to people that are not an addict already. This is not anything at all like Narcan. Narcan saves lives. Uh, Representative Pugh? <laughs> well, I, I wasn't sure that if that, I, I apologize, I wasn't sure if that was um, a question. And um, uh, Representative Goslin, this, this um, saves lives and this provides a um, 
a path towards treatment. And um, it is not, um, buprenorphine is not something that on the street people are using for recreation. There may be one or two people. I mean, I'm not saying that no one ever does, but this is, this is not the drug of choice on the street. It may not be the drug of choice on the street, but if you're not already addictive, it is a drug to get you in addiction. With um, Representative Gosselin, we heard some. We heard testimony that um, for some individuals, but not um, not all. So I guess just in clarification. If this drug was used properly for for what uh, for what the doctors prescribe, then it it it's it's an excellent avenue for the addicts to get off to get off their addiction, and I can appreciate that. What I worry about is the people that aren't already addicted that become addicts. And then we have more of a problem. And I've had a problem with that since day one. So uh, that's, that's, that's all I have for right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm actually gonna call on Selena Barber. I know your hand has been, um, been up, but uh, Selena might have some, something to add to these um, recent questions and, and concerns. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am happy to share, I did some pretty extensive research um, last biennium when we were working on this that really just looked at the peer reviewed research on um, uh, buprenorphine use and especially non prescribed buprenorphine use and I can put the link to um, that in the chat but I think in addition to all the excellent, excellent points that chair Pew raised, I just wanted to add a, a few others to the discussion. Um, and one, I think to both Ken and Tom's point, um, yes, there is potential for um, abuse of any substance, right? From NyQuil to Tylenol to all kinds of things. Um, but I think one of the important things to remember here is to really consider the alternative um, to buprenorphine, which is heroin and really by extension fentanyl because so, so much heroin these days has fentanyl in it, um, which is just, uh, can be quite fatal. I mean, it's why we have seen such a dramatic increase in Vermont and nationwide in fatal overdoses um, whereas many forms of buprenorphine are delivered um, in ways that, and certainly the most commonly um, used non-prescribed forms are include um, additional substances that prevent, help to prevent overdose. So again, to, when, when Chair Pugh says this is a harm reduction bill, um, I think that's I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I think that's part of what she means. Um, and I also want to note that um, there is actually a lot of research out there about, or a fair amount of research, growing body of research about folks who are using non-prescribed buprenorphine in these ways. And um, it backs up all the testimony that it sounds like they heard in the House Human Services Committee um, and that we heard some in our committee last biennium, which is that for the vast majority of folks, they're using this to manage symptoms of opioid use dependence. They're using it to avoid overdose. They're using it to prevent withdrawal. They're using it to be able to work and um, be um, engaged in their family and that in fact the research shows that for many many people this is actually one of the most effective pathways to supervised medically supervised treatment um, because people and we we had very powerful testimony about that um, last year that people start to really stabilize and get to the point where they are able to um, 
then work with a doctor for ongoing um, management. And one of the pieces of evidence that I found really most compelling um, as I was really digging into this is that in fact, folks, there are some studies that show that people who use non-prescribed buprenorphine and then go into medically supervised treatment actually do better in treatment than folks who are coming to it just totally fresh in a medically supervised environment. And I, I won't speculate about why that is, but the findings really show that there's more longevity in treatment for people who have first used this kind of on their own and just essentially tried it out and um, started to stabilize and then such, sought um, formal treatment. Um, and we know that longevity in medication assisted treatment is associated with better outcomes in terms of employment, in terms of all kinds of health factors, in terms of um, um, family life and a number of other factors that measure success. And so I just wanted to, I just wanted to add some of those points to the discussion because I think it's as representative Pew or Chair Pew said, it's, it's not a panacea, but um, we are really talking about um, life-saving measures here and the, the um, potential for abuse with the substance, certainly it's there, but it's, it's, it, the, um, it's just not the way it's being used in, in all of the evidence and research that, um, that we've heard on this topic. Thank you, Selena. Um, I see we have two more questions. Um, and it seems like folks need to discuss this more. So um, in terms of our star poll, but we'll wait. Um, if we get off the floor today, or this is on notice today, correct? Um, okay. Uh, so we can all, if we have to fit it in tomorrow morning, we can. But um, so quickly, Barbara, and then Bob, and then um, and then we'll adjourn for for lunch. So um, uh, I too was going to just share, having uh, worked in the field of addiction until very recently, that I've seen it make a big difference, especially when it is paired with counseling. But that doesn't always happen right away. And for every person we can get off of heroin or fentanyl, mm -hmm. the odds of them recovering is so great. But Chair Pew, I'm wondering, I know what um, you were talking about people uh, and the cost or insurance being a factor. Um, a few years ago, a factor was the wait list and the priority population. So pregnant women could get it, but their boyfriends couldn't. So they were wanting to figure out how to share it with their boyfriends so that they, in order to also help their own recovery because it, it was not gonna be helpful if one person in the family was getting treated and not another. And I think I've shared this before, but there was one father who said, I'm gonna have to, in order to get access to this, I'm gonna have to use intravenous drugs to get up on the waiting list. So I'm just wondering if waiting list is still an issue and um, if we, the more we chip away at that, obviously the fewer people will need this law, which I will strongly support in our poll and on the floor. Uh, it depends who you ask. <clears throat> okay. Uh, um, we will, um, we oftentimes say that people, everyone, everyone has access if they want it. Um, the, uh, the reality is when you hear testimony is that um, sometimes people can't get it. And during the pandemic, people could not get it. Um, every step we take, um, uh, we, um, I think all but one hospital, their emergency room, you can um, present um, and get three days worth of supply. Um, in Burlington, you can walk um, walk into safe recovery. Um, and uh, But in order for a doctor to be able to prescribe this, there is a, um, you need to um, go through um, a 
a federal um, procedure, and that has not changed yet. Vermont is doing better than other states um, in terms of this. One, we have um, um, from the beginning called this a, um, and identified this as a public health issue. And um, between the health department, the hospital and providers, um, people are, are, are moving, are moving in the direction of making it available. It's not necessarily um, at the right time and the right place for everyone. And as um, Representative Colburn said, in terms of the research that she read, that was the testimony that we actually um, have gotten over the past year uh, from, from prescribers, from doctors who are um, engaged in, um, in medically um, supervised um, treatment with um, individuals, that the ones who um, oftentimes are more ready and are, um, are more successful are, are, are people who initial, whose initial entry into treatment was um, uh, unprescribed buprenorphine. Thank you. Bob, last, you have the, the last question. Yes, and I'll make this quick because I want to eat too. Uh, I, I believe buprenorphine uh, is still considered a Schedule II drug slash narcotic. Uh, I didn't realize until I was hearing from Selena that we we're talking about unprescribed medications, which I, I found kind of astounding. I thought we we're talking about prescribed medications. I don't know the need for buprenorphine versus a uh, uh, prescription for Suboxone. We have clinics throughout uh, the state of Vermont, obviously, and I'm all for saving lives. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but my question, I guess, uh, whether Michelle or, or uh, Chair Pew is, of the 14 counties, uh, can you tell me how many uh, state attorneys have chosen not to uh, prosecute? Um, I, I will turn to Michelle. I believe we heard testimony yesterday, that three. Um, but I can't tell you um, whether that is all. They were, those were given as examples. And I'll, we'll check that with, I, I will find, I can find that answer for you. It, it would just be nice if we had consensus from our 14 state's attorneys, I guess. Um, well, it's I'm not sure we'll ever have consensus on, <laughs> regardless of what the topic is. Um, as we've heard uh, James Pepper come to our committee and say, it's it's very difficult to have one voice. So, uh, um, Michelle, did you want to? I was just going to add. I think what I've heard over the last few years is that um, you know there certainly are certain counties like Chittenden County. Have the state's attorney who has been outspoken in this particular area around doing it that doesn't necessarily that it's always getting charged in the places where state's attorneys haven't come out publicly as and stated it as policy my recollection was hearing that in general it is not used much statewide um and that the general practice is uh is is to not bring people in for when they're all amounts, people who are uh, who have substance use disorder, who have um, a smaller amount on them, even though it's not prescribed and technically a violation, but that they are technically not charged there. But I know that the other counties have a a kind of a rule, the way that like Chittenden County has come out and said we law enforcement know that they're not doing that. I can check with James to see whether or not he has a sense of that. Yeah, that, that'd be very helpful. And um, Selena, hopefully you have a yeah, super quick. Um, I do. I, I don't know if um, if the House Human Services Committee heard similar testimony, but I know that when the earlier proposal um, was in our committee last biennium, we heard from some states attorneys, like State's Attorney George, who had made a very clear decision not to um, to prosecute, and then we heard from others who said, "I like I don't have the I don't feel like I have the option not to pr prosecute it because it's actually on the books as a crime." So different 
um, state's attorneys have different, I think, relationships to prosecutorial discretion. And my sense, at least from the testimony we had heard a couple of years ago, is that um, you know there, there were folks who were actively choosing not to prosecute it, and then there were folks who were potentially supportive of the policy, but um, wanted the law to be changed to be able to make that choice. So this is also partly to answer that need, I think. Okay, thank you. Anything else, uh, Chair Pugh? Yeah, I got a quick question if we have time. Okay. I, I, I just scanned through the bill real quick and I didn't see it, but I didn't know if, uh, say if somebody was arrested or, or picked up on a civil charge two, three, four, five times, whatever, for, for possession of the 224 or less, does, uh, is there a criminal penalty uh, if you've got too many uh, civil penalties stacked on top of each other? That's, um, so the civil penalty is only for the 16 to 20 year olds. Uh, and, um, and it does not after so many turn into a crime. Um, it's modeled after what we do with underage possession of alcohol and cannabis. Okay. Yep. And so it's following that exactly because it's doing it through incorporation by reference. And so it's, it's tapped into an existing system of how we deal with treating under in possession of something that is otherwise not penalized. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to go back and listen to your walkthrough anyway, Michelle. So uh, feel free also, you can shoot me an email if you've got questions or set up a time with me and we can chat on the phone. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chair Pugh. Thank you. Well, thank you, committee. Um, originally, Tom and I had a training at 3.30 today, um, which is why we were going to, if we do get off the floor, we were going to end earlier, but that has been rescheduled. So um, if we, um, let's keep in touch. If we do get off the floor um, at a reasonable hour, let's, let's come back. We have plenty to do, <laughs> um, including <laughs> continuing to discuss this. So thank you.